so the faculty advisor of IIM on the chapter in the forefront and he will not take up the podium for further proceedings. Thank you, uh, Satyajit. Uh, so a very good afternoon to Professor Eckerd and uh, uh, it's really our uh, uh, our privilege that uh, he has agreed uh, to give a talk on uh, today's uh, event of age three. <coughs> so uh, just uh, I, I start with uh, the proceedings. Uh, age three is an event which is uh, organized jointly by Stilan Energy Raukala's Material Advantage Chapter and as well as Indian Institute of Metals Raukala Student Chapter. The major objective of this event is to create a platform so that all the participants can share the knowledge in terms of different quizzes, technical and post presentations, and as well as different case study type brainstorming session. So today is the inaugural day of that particular event. And uh, before I request uh, Professor Rickard, I'm just going to give a brief introductions about Professor Eker. Uh, <laughs> Professor Eker today will be talking on tuning uh, structure and properties of high performance metal stable alloys for engineering applications. And uh, Professor Eker is the chair of material physics at uh, Mountain University at Leuven, Austria, and director of Eric Smith Institute of Material Science, Austrian Academy of Science. Previously, he was the director of Institute of Complex Materials at the Leibniz Institute of Solid State and uh, Material Research Dresden, IFW Dresden. He was a professor at uh, Dresden University of Technology, Germany, Darmstadt University of Technology, Germany. He's also the fellow of uh, Material Research Society, MRS. He has received several distinguished awards, including Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Award, German Research Foundations, Ismanam Senior Scientist Award, Usman Lee Lecture Award, that's uh, Gessel Crab for Material Kunde DGM Prize, ERC Advanced Grant, European Research Council. His research interest includes metastable materials, material physics, material science and processing. Personally speaking, I met with Professor Rickard in uh, uh, Ismanam uh, uh, 2016 in uh, Nara City, Japan, where I interacted with Professor Rickard and uh, really his uh, uh, talk was extremely, extremely uh, uh, created a huge knowledge base for me also. So I think today's uh, uh, lecture is going to create a brainstorming uh, session among all the participants. So thank you, sir, once again. And uh, now I request for your distinguished talk. Sir, please. So first of all, Thank you very much for the for the introduction. I try, but I cannot show my slides right away. So you probably have to give me some kind of option that I can upload my talk. Hopefully. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, now it works. Perfect. Thanks so much. So let's see that everything finally works properly. Okay, I hope I hope it works and I hope it also moves at the end of the day. If there is a problem, then please just let me know. Sure, sir. So once again, thanks a lot for the introduction. I would do it a bit, a bit shorter. I would say, okay, I'm just a guy from Germany who has a little bit fun in materials physics and trying to create new alloys. Uh, and that's a little bit the topic of my of my today's talk. Mm, the title says, Tuning Structure and Properties of High Performance Metastable Alloys, etc. And what I wanna do is I wanna show some examples how the structure at the end of the day determines properties. Of course, I cannot do this for everything. So I will focus a little bit on metastable alloys. And since this is <clears throat> how to say a little bit the background or a little bit my hobby, if you wish, uh, I will focus mostly on systems that form amorphous structures, nanocrystalline structures, and also want to focus a little bit on 
how you can tune the structure in such systems and what this has, what kind of impact this has on the mechanical properties mostly. As you can see from the title slide, of course, this is a, a work that is done by a lot of people and I try to combine the results of a lot of people. So the list here, the names don't necessarily tell you anything, of course. It's a mixture of my co-workers that come from a lot of different countries, as you can perhaps see from the name. Some are Austrian, like Florian here. Uh, some others are Chinese or Romanian. Uh, there are, over the years, a lot of Indian students that came over first to Germany and then later on also to Austria after I moved to Austria. And it's always fun to interact with the different communities and the different ideas that come into the game through this kind of uh, collaboration. Of course, the whole thing has some impact with respect to funding. So I, at the very beginning, I simply want to acknowledge some of the funding sources from Europe, basically, from Germany, from China, for instance, and FWF is, a, is an Austrian funding agency. So what is it all about? I mean, everybody talks about future technologies, mentioning something like nanotechnologies, whatever. A lot of issues are related nowadays to green energy, energy generation, energy storage, batteries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I would say the bottom line in all these cases is that you usually have materials around, but you also want to develop new more advanced or more optimized materials or composite structure or material structures. Uh, and this also is usually linked to the way how you produce these materials. And this creates something like what I always like to call something like structure, property, to some extent processing correlations. So whatever you get as a structure at the end of the day, which of course turns into the properties, also depends on the way how you create it, what kind of options you have. This holds for a lot of different properties. They can be mechanical, but this also can be electrochemical properties, magnetic properties, for instance. Uh, so the idea is always a little bit, how can we design and tune structures or microstructures to finally get optimized processes and processing conditions and at the end, of course, properties. This is just one chart that shows if you focus a little bit on mechanical properties that, of course, there is a broad range of different type of alloys around. This is just a kind of Ashby map that compares something like the fracture toughness as a function of yield strength, for instance, for different classes of materials. And you can always say, now, yeah, where is the gap in between? Where is the room for creating new materials? But just for instance, here in this box here, you have a variety of different metallic glasses, meaning amorphous structures that have quite unique properties, for instance. So there is always a way of finding and creating new materials or new structures. The idea with some of these alloys, of course, may be that you want to overcome what you typically call something like the inverse strength, ductility, or toughness kind of problem so that you all know from the textbooks. So either you have a material that is pretty strong, pretty hard, then it's usually relatively brittle or completely brittle. On the other hand, if something is easily deformable, then it's usually quite soft. And of course, you want to have something at the end of the day that goes somewhere where there's a red arrow points to. You want to have something with a high strength, for instance, but combined with that, at least a decent ductility, that you basically can deform something, that you can shape something into a given part structure, component structure. So one way of thinking about this whole thing is can we somehow combine in, let's say, a little bit exotic alloys, something like a high strength, and on the other end, perhaps something like a decent deform deformability or a decent toughness. And this, of course, can go in a lot of different application areas. This is just one example. So I picked out a slide for titanium alloys. Well, you probably all know on one end, a lot of titanium alloys are used somewhere in the automotive area, uh, for instance, as, as pistons or whatever. 
uh, in aircraft systems from turbine blades to other high strength components can also go into something like medical applications where you want to have something that is relatively strong, that is biocompatible, uh, for instance, as fixations for bone fixations or something like that, and should have on one end a high strength. Of course, it shouldn't be brittle. You don't want to have such an implant to, to fail in a brittle fashion at the end of the day. And there, one of the ideas behind the whole scene is that you also want to, for instance, adjust Young's modulus or the stiffness of such a plate here to something that is more comparable to the human bone like it is nowadays the case. So I just want to mention, okay, and this holds for different type of alloys, of course. It also holds for steels or for aluminum alloys that whatever you create <coughs> can usually go in completely different areas, perhaps. Of course, with specific alloy optimization. And when I talk a little bit about structure or microstructure, then of course you all know that usually materials are not single phase. Uh, or in a lot of cases, to put it the other way around, you can combine and modulate different phases. Uh, this is just an example, for instance, of crystals in an amorphous matrix, in a glassy matrix. This could also be let's say, a high entropy alloys matrix or something else. Uh, the only thing I want to mention here is that, of course, you can easily modulate the volume fraction, but you can also easily or relatively easily modulate the size between something that is pretty tiny, maybe nanostructured, to something that has, if you come from the solidification of a melt, let's say maybe a dendritic appearance and much larger. So, Besides just combining different phases, you also can, of course, modify the morphology. You can go even a little bit more exotic on the right-hand side, for instance, is a schematic sketch that should show, okay, you could have even amorphous systems that undergo a phase separation if you get the thermodynamics right. And if you have a system that wants to phase separate, where you could have, again, a kind of connectivity where you could have isolated particles, in this case now, for instance, of two amorphous phases that coexist with each other, or you could have nanocrystals in the phase-separated matrix. And all this at the end of the day is basically governed by thermodynamics, which tells you, okay, what phases would you expect, what phases would you get, and the kinetics with respect, for instance, to grain growth, with respect to solidification, uh, coarsening of phases, etc. So it's always this combination of thermodynamics and kinetics that basically determine at the end of the day what you may get. And besides this, uh, of course, you always have as a more or less basic variable something like the composition. This is just shown here for a schematic pseudo ternary diagram where we investigated, for instance, cobalt, chromium, molybdenum, carbon, boron type of alloys. The complexity already tells you, okay, in one direction, if you want to go, you could go into a direction of high entropy alloys, for instance, crystalline high entropy alloys. On the other end, if you process these materials a little bit more exotic, you may also get something like amorphous phases, as denoted here with these open circles, for instance or combinations of amorphous and crystalline materials. So composition is one way to tune the phase formation. On the other end, of course, if you, for instance, just consider something like a CCT diagram, if you start with an initially homogeneous composition somewhere up there in a, in a melt and you quench it, then of course you can do this at different quenching rates, at different speeds. This should be roughly denoted by these arrows here. So if in some of the systems, if you do this very fast, then you bypass the nose of this crystalline phase here, and you would freeze something into really an amorphous structure, into a glassy structure at the end of the day. So this would be basically something correlated to this point here for a given composition, where you could really create an amorphous phase. If you do this, let's say, very slow, then everything may crystallize. If you do this somewhere in between, you may have something like crystals 
precipitating, similar roughly shown like here or like here, uh, in a certain morphology in a remaining liquid that finally may freeze into a glass. So again, the way how you process a given composition determines the phases that you may have and also determines the morphology, whether this may be, for instance, a dendritic morphology of these primary precipitates or something else. In addition, of course, you can also always quench something and then reheat it. So, I mean, in a normal textbook, you would say, now, yeah, we simply anneal the material. In glass forming system, that's a bit more unique because in such glass forming liquids that freeze into an amorphous structure, you have a glass transition when you heat it up. So this basically means like you may know it from window glass, for instance, beyond a certain temperature, beyond the so-called glass transition temperature, that's this TG here, you reach an area that is typically called supercooled liquid region again. So basically the material strongly softens and this basically means that you can easily shape metallic parts in this temperature region before you crystallize it. So this gives you another temperature time window where you could do easy shaping of very intricate parts, for instance. So why do I hop so much on, on amorphous systems? Because if I want to have something like a high strength, for instance, then such systems are rather unique to some extent. Simply because of the fact that you have an amorphous structure, you don't have any crystalline translational symmetry, like you know it from crystalline unit cells, etc. But you have something like an uh, amorphous structure, which could be shown roughly in a 2D sketch like this, or in a kind of 3D schematic, if you wish, like that. So you basically have individual clusters that, <coughs> I hope you can see it from this 3D or this 2D sketch, have a certain short range order, but no long range crystallinity, no long range periodicity. And this of course means when you think about deformation, mechanical deformation, you don't have any dislocations. So by definition, uh, you would think, now yeah, this may allow you to almost reach the theoretical strength limit of, of a material. Because you basically would say, I have no crystal defects, I have no dislocations, so I rip perhaps the bonds apart, and if I rip bonds apart, this basically means I reach the theoretical strength. The reality is a little bit different, because in reality, the deformation in such amorphous systems happens by shear band formation. So this is shown here schematically uh, in one way, in terms of so-called shear transformation zones, so what this basically means is you have little clusters like also shown here and there. And then you apply a shear stress and you basically shear these clusters. I hope you can see that the geometry or the shape of this cluster here slightly changes if I shear it along this plane here. This is something that you would see in reality. For instance, like these lines here, these are basically lines of shear bands that if this is a thin ribbon that you bend, for instance, that evolve, you also see discrete shear steps here on the surface. You also can already see now yeah, there is some kind of branching of these shear bands. This is due to the local stress state that you finally evolve. But what you have to keep in mind is that basically the deformation is localized in shear planes. In between, the volume is relatively unaffected. This is something that is related also to the so-called free volume. So basically the wide areas, if you want to say so similar like uh, point defects in a crystalline structure, you have a so-called free volume in such amorphous cluster structures uh, shown here a little bit more localized than this. So this gives you an extra yeah, free volume like the name says. And this means also that you have a little bit less densely packed areas in the materials that you can to some extent consider a little bit as a relatively soft spot in all these cluster structures. Nevertheless, in a typical glassy solid, similar like you know it, as I said, from window glass, fracture would happen macroscopically under roughly 45 degrees uh, due to a catastrophic shear plane 
that evolves. And this is just the appearance of a macroscopically fractured specimen under tension. And you can hopefully easily see, okay, there is a catastrophic failure almost under 45 degrees. This is, of course, something that you don't want to have for engineering applications. So you have to find some ways to get around this problem of this severe shear localization, which, by the way, would also happen if it's a very fine-grained nanocrystalline structure, for instance. You may have similar problems. Uh, so the question at the end of the day is how can you tune or tailor phases, microstructures, heterogeneities to somehow avoid this catastrophic failure. Brings me back to the picture that we already saw. So you can play with the solidification conditions. You can play with different phases, with different morphology. So just imagine, for instance, you would precipitate something like relatively soft crystalline dendrites in a hard amorphous matrix. To some extent, this means, now, yeah, it's a kind of, or what you would expect is a kind of composite structure combining hard and strong, but maybe brittle, plus relatively soft, but on the other hand, ductile phases. And the overall phase mixture, if you want to call it like that, should be somehow a compromise in terms of deformation capability. So it should be some kind of contribution from the strong matrix, let's say, and some of the catastrophic failure may be blocked or prevented by some of these ductile inclusions. This is basically just the bottom line. This is something that you can create either by quenching at a given speed, hitting the nose, but not fully crystallizing, but precipitating, let's say, such dendrites from the liquid as a primary phase. Or you could also do it the other way around. You could quench something, make it fully amorphous, then heat it up again either isochronally or heat up to a given temperature and anneal isothermally, hit the nose again, and then you would also precipitate crystals. Maybe not exactly the same phase as I showed in one of the following slides, but in any case, it will also lead to a kind of composite structure. So the way how you treat these, these alloys, or let's say the time temperature history also plays a dominant role on what kind of properties you may achieve. To give you an idea how the whole thing can be can be tuned is something like this picture here that simply shows you, at least schematically, you have in both cases a glassy matrix, you have a crystalline second phase. Uh, in this case, it's a it's a BCC phase beta titanium phase that precipitates in a dendritic fashion. On the other end, it's something like a cubic shape memory phase. It's basically a B2 structure that also precipitates in a glassy matrix. And at the first glance, when you see the deformation curves for the two examples, then you see, okay, there is quite some ductility, but for the one with the beta titanium dendrites, you basically just see a very pronounced necking, so you see no real work hardening. Uh, for the other ones, basically with the shape memory phases or precipitates, you see a kind of transformation induced plasticity. There is basically a continuous phase change uh, that creates, if you want to say so, modern civic structures. And this contributes quite a lot to the ongoing work hardening capability. So, the simple idea of saying, okay, I create some kind of soft phase embedded in a hard matrix or a brittle matrix is too simple. So you also have to worry very much about the intrinsic properties of these phases, plus the interaction, for instance, of shear bands and how stable these precipitates are. Uh, and only the combination of different mechanisms all together at the end basically give you these kind of outstanding properties here. One problem with this is that, for instance, uh, this primary solidifying phase, be it the B2 phase or this beta titanium phase, uh, is hard to control, or the solidification is hard to control upon solidification. On the left-hand side, you see how far you can tune or how much the properties change as a function of volume fraction when you have such B2 precipitates like shown here in the micrographs 
in a glassy matrix. Uh, on the other end, what you can also see from these micrographs is that this is by far not a homogeneous microstructure. And this is due to the fact that this B2 phase precipitates very close to the nose of the CCT diagram. So the precipitation reaction is very hard to control. You can model this a little bit nevertheless. What this tells you, if you come from the melt, then you usually get a pretty lousy microstructure to say it in simple words. Uh, and it's very hard to control the properties. What you can do much better and much easier is the other way around. You quench something, make it fully amorphous, and then you heat it up again and hold isothermally, quench again, or you, as I said, you can also do this isochronically with a constant heating rate. And this usually pre precipitates relatively small nanocrystals or dendrites, depending on the way you actually do it. Uh, from the initially amorphous phase. The trick is that you have to do this quite fast, so you can usually only do this due to the kinetics of the reaction, only by something like flash annealing. So this is something like, uh, for instance, like I show here for some ribbons, uh, where you would, for instance, push uh, or exploit joule heating. So you basically push a current through such ribbons and let it use the heat that you evolve basically for the crystallization reaction. And I hope you can see, okay, in all these different cases here, well, just the difference is basically the increase in heating rate upon this reheating, that you get a little bit different phases. So it's not so simple that you just get this desired B2 phase, only if you do this in the appropriate time temperature window, you really get an amorphous phase like shown here from the X-ray diffraction pattern plus, for instance, this desired modern city, modern city transforming B2 structure. And this allows you to also get the microstructure pretty right. So it's much more homogeneous than you would have it upon real solidification or simply upon casting. And this at the end, you can summarize a little bit. The world in reality is a little bit more tricky, so it's not just one nose for one phase, but you have this desired B2 structure that you want to have. Below there is a metastable phase regime where also this B2 structure may transform into a relatively brittle in a metallic phase that you don't want to have. Or if you do this even much slower, then you're closer to the equilibrium phase diagram and you get basically two in a metallics that also don't give you the appropriate properties. So what you basically have to know is the phase space and how fast you have to heat. Uh, but nevertheless, if you know this, then you can really get also something in tension that has a pretty high strength value for such alloys together with a more or less pronounced ductility. And this is now in tension, so this tells you, okay, if you go in such a direction, then you can really exploit the potential of such alloys at the end of the day for some kind of engineering applications. So this is just meant to show you a little bit how far you can tune this. So you have to analyze what phases form under which conditions and link this with the properties. Of course, this is something that you, for instance, now have in form of a th relatively thin ribbon. This may be good for some applications, for instance, for some little MEMS applications or nano MEMS, basically, nanostructured MEMS systems, but not for bulk parts. Uh, so you wonder how far you can drive this. Can we do this perhaps locally? Can we modulate the structure locally? And I just have basically two, I think two slides that show you a little bit how the direction evolved over the years. So one idea was to say, okay, why not do we simply use a plate, a cast plate, plus perhaps an electron beam? or a laser beam, or locally simply do something like local arc melting, basically remelt such a big plate locally. As you can easily see, this basically means that you get a local melt pool. So you basically can trigger this in a given volume, one after the other. This has some kind of stress variations. This has some kind of local structure variations that you can 
halfway at least C in such kind of sketches here. So this means the Young's modulus, for instance, changes locally, etc. And the deformation curves may change depending how much you precipitate of this second phase and how you really do this. So we spend quite a lot of time to investigate how this can be transformed, let's say, from a from a thin ribbon to something that has a bulk structure. And of course, the next step then is that you can think about additive manufacturing. So I just have this one slide here because everything else would be probably way too much. But if you understand how the melting and solidification or reheating procedures run, then of course you can also use something like additive manufacturing where you locally melt something. So again, besides that you can create 3D parts with a quite complex geometry, for instance, you can basically do something like local phase formation, local phase modification, for instance, also if you reheat this. And I just want to show this, this is now a totally different alloy system, that's a soft magnetic iron-based alloy uh, that we, or similar alloys, that we investigate basically for soft magnetic components uh, let's say in electrical drives as stators or transformers or whatever. And you can also hopefully see, okay, you can even get something that is exotic or, and in that sense, amorphous uh, during additive manufacturing, or you can create such two-phase mixtures like it's shown here. So this is the, for me as a material scientist, the unique, unique aspect of additive manufacturing that you have relatively high quenching rates that nevertheless allow you to build up 3D structured parts at the end. What was previously just more or less limited maybe to thin ribbons or something like that. Now I have some, some slides and chapters because what I showed so far means that I talk about amorphous structures. And I already also mentioned, for instance, that these amorphous structures, they do have a short range order, they do have a medium range order, but of course no crystalline periodicity. Nevertheless, remember these little cluster structures that I tried to show you. You have a distinct short and medium range order over a couple of angstroms uh, to give you an idea about what size or length scale we talk about. And of course one can wonder is it possible or what happens, for instance, if we do melting at different temperatures? So what you typically do is you overheat the melt to a certain degree, in this case maybe almost 200 degrees, above the equilibrium melting point of the alloy. The idea behind this is then of course also in the liquid you have a structure that is relatively similar to, to an amorphous structure, it's a liquid structure. Again, comprised of different clusters, different cluster structures. So you would say, okay, if we overheat to a different degree, shown here for different temperatures, uh, maybe the structure is a little bit different. At the first glance, if you quench from these different temperatures, then you don't really see anything. Everything looks more or less amorphous. Also, if you do this uh, in a TEM, you don't really see crystals in there. Nevertheless, if you do calorimetry scans, you see, okay, there are subtle changes in there. So the glass transition slightly shifts, the onset of crystallization, that's this peak here, changes a little bit depending how far you, and how long you overheat this kind of alloy system. And this would tell you, okay, there are subtle changes in the short and the medium range order. This is something that you can probe later on with respect to the properties, for instance, by hardness measurements, by deformation tests, etc. And what you find, for instance, now, yeah, it seems that the hardness uh, increases with this glass transition temperature. Uh, or this, like I showed in the previous slide, this glass transition temperature depends on the overheating temperature. So this would tell you, okay, whatever you measure in terms of thermal stability data on one end depends on how you treat the liquid in the first place, and this affects also the properties. So this means there must be a slight change in the short and medium range order. 
if you have a closer look for this, then you can do this, for instance, by taking samples, going to a synchrotron, do radio distribution function analysis, and check in detail uh, for the possible structure changes. If you look for these curves here, then this is basically done for samples with a different overheating temperature. And at the first glance, everything looks pretty much amorphous. Everything looks pretty much the same. If you look a little bit more careful, you see very subtle changes in here. So you see slight deviations in these first and second nearest neighbor arrangements. Uh, and this tells you, aha, uh -huh, in detail, in reality, there is really a change of the short and the medium range order. You can drive this analysis further on. And I made life a little bit too simple, so you don't have just one cluster structure, but you have different clusters that in reality coordinate around different atoms, around zirconium atoms, for instance, copper atoms, and aluminum atoms in such an alloy. So you can map out the probability of finding different clusters for the different overheating temperatures. And again, what you find are slight changes, subtle changes that tells you at the end of the day that in reality really this overheating temperature determines a little bit the cluster structure. So depending on whether you heat uh, to relatively high temperatures, whether you do this at relatively low overheating temperatures, you may have more or less pronounced clusters. One type of cluster that is relatively prominent in such alloys are icosahedral type clusters, so basically something with a five-fold symmetry that doesn't want to really form crystals, uh, which intuitively would tell you, Naya, this should be or could be a kind of building block that exists in glass forming liquids because they don't really want to form crystals. And they're relatively densely coordinated, relatively hard, so this would counteract and, and or would basically fit to the idea of saying if the overheating temperature is relatively high and I have more rigid like icosahedral type clusters, then also the overall hardness may be perhaps higher. So this roughly fits together. And this should simply tell you or show you, now yeah, if you modulate the liquid structure, the properties may change, and you have to ver look very closely to really find the differences. On the other end, I told you, okay, these alloys have a glass transition temperature. So if I heat them up again, uh, they become soft beyond the glass transition temperature without crystallizing. And this I already mentioned is a, is a temperature window where you can easily shape this. So you can make nano patterns uh, because you simply shape a liquid. Basically, you shape a liquid. And this is just, the features are then just governed by the surface tension, not by crystalline grains, not by grain boundaries or whatever that may interfere. What you typically have is, uh, on the other end, a problem. Because if you heat up something beyond the glass transition temperature, typically, in the, let's say, most of the amorphous or glass forming alloys, these alloys in brittle again because they relax, they lose this free volume, and this means they become a little bit more brittle again. They become a little bit dense, more densely packed, and this favors brittleness. So this is somehow then detrimental, of course. So you want to see, <clears throat> can we regain something like this free volume if we treat the alloy? You can do this, for instance, saying, okay, you shape something above Tg without crystallization, and then you quench it, let's say, to liquid nitrogen temperature, for instance. So ASF means as formed, so you heat it above Tg, form a part, and then you quench it. Or you do this by quenching and low temperature annealing, for instance, at 173K for a certain time. This should rejuvenate the material, this should introduce again more free volume, this should counteract a little bit this brittleness. You can do this by thermal treatment, but you can also do this by mechanical loading. So for instance, if you would load a sample at somewhere 70 to 90% of the yield strength, 
in the nominally elastic regime, then you can also induce a little bit free volume. This is something you can do by static means. This means electrostatic loading, or you can also do this in a cyclic fashion. What this does is it doesn't really change at the first sense the amorphous structure. Everything still looks amorphous. Uh, again, even if you do diffraction beam, uh, diffraction analysis, you don't really find a lot of crystals. On the other end, if you have a look for the deformation curves, this slightly changes. So this tells you again the deformation characteristics, and this also means the short and the medium range order, they slightly change. And this causes, at least to some extent, in some cases, as I said, a kind of rejuvenation. This is just a table that summarizes some of the properties. You will never remember this anyway. But the message out of this is the most efficient way to restore a certain amount of plasticity in such systems is you treat them mechanically. If you do some of elastostatic or dynamic loading, in the nominally elastic regime. So this means you can readjust structures and readjust properties. Again, later on, crystals, you would say you just anneal them or you may forge them. Uh, here you can also in such amorphous systems, of course, play with temperature, play with deformation. And this basically restores <coughs> more or less, uh, if you compare, the black curve, which is basically the S formed, and this is the rejuvenated one. This basically restores the thermal stability properties again. And if you do a very, very tedious analysis with nanobeam diffraction and so on, you can really map out again uh, the short and the medium range order without finding any crystallinity. And this is something you can do. Why do we need to understand these short and medium range order arrangements? Simply because, remember, we have a system that basically deforms by shear. This is this shear transformation model again. Uh, I will not go too much into the details, but what you have in reality is something like an SLB inclusion, basically something like an elastic distortion in the first place. Finally, you shear these clusters. This is energetically more favorable. This is basically connected with a certain driving force. If you shear these clusters, so basically the mechanical load provides the energy that drives the system. And in reality, this is linked to something like so-called shear transformation zones, tiny little entities of a couple of atoms or maybe up to 100 atoms that locally shear. This is associated with a certain stress field around these entities. This is a little bit shown by these arrows and these different local stress fields also lead to rotation, to coalescence of such individual shear transformation zones. So you have to understand the local structure basically in the first place to understand how the local deformation steps occur. This is similar like if you want to know what's the structure of a, of a crystal, you have to do a structure analysis. So if you want to know how the dislocations proceed, how they react, how they may interact with each other, on a local scale, you have to know what is their correlation with the, with the, with the structure. This is nothing else here, just in an amorphous system. And this also tells you that Usually, even if everything looks amorphous on a macroscopic scale, there are slight variations in these short and medium range order arrangements on a smaller length scale. This is nothing else but basically a micro hardness map out of a cast glass forming zirconium base alloy and denoted by the different colors at different hardness values. So, this tells you there are no nanocrystals in there. These are just local hardness fluctuations that at the end of the day basically stem from the slightly different local cooling conditions. So this means again, you have something like little more or less pronounced local hardness variations in your bulk system. So again, if you simplify this a lot, 
then you can say, now, yeah, I have something like relatively hard, relatively soft regions in my material. So it's not fully isotropic, it's not fully homogeneous. Again, this is something, without going into the details, that you can analyze by analyzing in detail the pair distribution functions, linking this with different cluster structures, with different hardnesses. So here you have different nearest neighbor shells. You can link this in a, in a very sophisticated way with different cluster structures, with different local hardnesses. So this is something that you can get out of nanobeam analysis and uh, local strain measurements, for instance, in a TM under high resolution conditions. This is shown something like here. For instance, you do nanobeam diffraction, analyze these diffraction spots here. And out of this, you can basically derive at the end of the day a cluster size of these medium range order clusters, for instance, for different ones. So nevertheless, what this message should simply be is without going again into the details, you can link these hardness fluctuations in different alloys with local cluster structures. And this tells you why you have these hardness fluctuations, because that's basically linked to the prob different probability of different cluster structures in the material. And this is something that you have to know that you can also check uh, via in situ heating, for instance, in a TEM, what happens to these cluster structures? How do they change? How do they finally evolve, for instance, into something like nanocrystals, like you also see here from the discrete diffraction spots? And see at the end of the day, if you also do this together jointly with in situ deformation at a given temperature in the TEM, then you can really see how these shear transformation zones evolve, how shear bands evolve, and how they propagate. This is roughly sketched here. So again, you can understand cluster structure. You can think about what happens if I shear such clusters. And at the end of the day, if you combine this with local structure and with local hardness mod modulations, then you can understand at the end of the day why a shear band coalesces from some of these soft regions here and why this finally evolves into a macroscopic shear band and finally into a crack. Uh, so just one final comment. So far, I basically showed you tedious experiments, if you want to say so. But at the end of the day, what you have to do in a lot of cases is simply also yeah, supportive modeling. So what we typically do is, it's something that, that my colleague Daniel Schuppo does together with two PhDs, for instance, to do molecular dynamic simulations to understand these hardness fluctuations, to link this on a, really on an atomic scale with shear transformation areas where you can calculate local stress variation. So you can basically calculate something like the atomic scale uh, stress and strain field in such a material. This is something that you can also link with density fluctuations or local entropy fluctuations that should tell you what is more ordered, what is more disordered in that sense. Uh, and if you do this, in a systematic fashion, then you can, for instance, say, OK, I see how my shear strain evolves, finally uh, winding up, let's say, in, into a shear band that finally also may branch. So the strain basically gives you some information about how this local shear events proceed. And on the other end, you can link this via a local entropy uh, with a local structure distortion, if you want to say so. And at the end of the day, you can say, OK, this local structure distortion or the local disordering, if you wish, correlates, of course, with the local strain to some extent. So this basically gives you somehow a correlation between order, disorder, and local, local shearing or local straining events. And this is something that you need for really getting an atomistic picture of the whole scenario. This it's just a similar kind of sketch that shows you how shear bands evolve uh, and how the shear strain evolves through such kind of calculations. So I hope at the end of the day it was not too confusing. I tried to show you a little bit that 
Such metastable alloys are a fascinating playground. This was just one glimpse. I could do a similar kind of talk, of course, with respect, let's say, to high entropy alloys or nanostructured metallic systems, etc. And I hope I could show you that you always have to worry a little bit about heterogeneity, about structure in a static fashion, but also in a dynamic fashion. So what happens if I load something? What happens if I quench something? That, of course, the structure on one end is always linked to the processing conditions. That's why I say here something like thermal history or processing characteristics, if you wish. That, as I said, in a lot of cases, you have combinations of phases with different intrinsic properties that at the end of the day basically determine the properties. So I think this altogether is a fascinating playground for new alloys, for new composite structures with somehow outstanding or unique properties. You can drive this further on by combining different phases, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think there's a huge playground for simply creating new materials. And this is a lot of fun. Of course, this is only possible if a lot of people help you. So we have a lot of interactions with different people all over the world, basically. And yeah, whenever you have a chance, when the virus is over, perhaps uh, have a have a look and, and try to come to Austria for some time, or at least some of you. These are just pictures of the neighborhood in Leoben. Leoben is a tiny little town in the southeastern part of Austria. Uh, we see some mountains down there. On the other hand, we have a river, so we have a relatively calm and well, calm climate, a lot of sunny days. Uh, we have some historic buildings uh, like here, and we also have a link with a Chinese partner city, so we also have a little bit Asian flair in there. Uh, so as I said, whenever you have a chance, you're more than welcome. So thanks a lot for listening. Uh, and yeah, let's see what kind of questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. talk. And uh, I think uh, between uh, direct uh, new developments of uh, BMGs and address the challenges of processing and uh, developing of BMGs with enhanced properties. Now I think the session is open for discussions. If anybody has any questions, we can uh, start asking. Uh, so, uh, thank you for nice and enlightening presentation and lecture, sir. I learned a lot from you. So, one question from my side that uh, regarding uh, the high entropy region, and there is a CR band formation in uh, copper zirconium metallic glass uh, you have shown. So, what mm -hmm. is the uh, what is the correlation between high entropy region and the CR band formation in uh, morphologically or topologically in the specimen? Why it is happening like that? I would say it this way. The first, the first part is that, of course, you don't have a crystalline lattice. So this basically means you have to have some kind of local shear. That's more or less only, only possibility of shearing these clusters, but you don't have something that evolves in a, in a translational fashion. Uh, there is a certain analogy in that sense that you can say, Naya, if I consider something like such a shear transformation zone as, how to call this, unit of plasticity, if you wish, then of course the similarities with this location, motion, interaction is that of course you also have to ask, how do such entities interact? How do they propagate? How stable are they, etc. This is one comment, and this is linked with the structure. Because, for instance, if I modify the alloy composition, then I may promote different local cluster structures. And, for instance, in a in a nutshell, this means these shear transformation zones become larger or smaller, right? So they could be in a very rigid system, relatively small. Uh, the larger they become the more disordered typically the, the amorphous structure is, because I simply have more coordinated atomic arrangements that are necessary for really creating this shear. The link with the high entropy is in that sense that if I say uh, high entropy, 
is something like the name says. Uh, you could also call it chemically complex, but that doesn't matter. Uh, I increase the entropy of a system. So in simple words, I introduce more disorder. So the similarity or the link between whether this is crystalline or whether this is amorphous at the end of the day, although one is a crystal, one is an amorphous structure, is the entropy, it's the local disorder. Uh, so for instance, if I introduce more and more disorder into a crystal, this may affect the deformation characteristics. This may affect the diffusion. In a similar way, the same story happens if I do this in an amorphous system. So there I would say is the link between these different type of materials, right? Hope that was halfway the answer to your question. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. And is there any relation between the Voronoi polyhedra uh, clustering, so was distorted icosahedral polyhedra, or kind of things with, with, with respect to formation of CR bending in this system? That's a good question. Uh, it's not easy to answer. So let's say it this way. Uh, the first comment I should make is that, of course, it's not just one type of cluster that exists both in the liquid and also in the amorphous solid. It's a mixture or combination of different clusters or different cluster motives, if you want to say so. Uh, the only thing that changes depending on the processing characteristics, etc., is something like the probability of finding these different clusters. So if you change, for instance, the quenching rate, you can, like I tried to show with this overheating example, you can somehow modulate or change the probability of finding specific structures. This is one comment. So if I start disordering, if I start annealing on the other end, I modulate the probability of finding different clusters. This is one comment. The second comment is, for instance, if I take something uh, like copper zirconium or copper zirconium aluminum that has a relatively pronounced probability of finding such icosahedral clusters, then like I tried to show these icosahedral clusters, if they are very prominent, usually promote glass formation because they will not like to be in a crystalline structure, of course. Uh, if they have to crystallize, they transform into an FCC cluster type of structure. On the other end, if I start shearing such an ensemble of a lot of icosahedral clusters plus some, some FCC, for instance, uh, then I disorder these clusters. So what happens is it, it turns from, a, from an ideal icosahedral clusters to something like a distorted icosahedron or a kind of distorted dodecahedron type of arrangement. So I locally disorder, shear or disorder some of these clusters again, which leads to local softening. Uh, on the other end, there is always a kind of counterbalance. So if I start this deforming such a material, I destroy some of the clusters, but I also build some of them again, because this kind of Shearing of clusters is in some sense also a kind of atomistic shuffling, if you wish. Uh, and the question how fast I do this, meaning what kind of strain rate I have, what kind of temperature I have, uh, determines at the end of the day the balance between these individual structure motives. So uh, you can drive the system probably either way. You can either locally distort everything and soften it, if you wish, or if you do it the other way around, especially if you do this at high strain rates, you can also promote, again, some kind of local hardening. I think this is still valid, although it's more empirical. Uh, so, glass forming systems. Uh, how to tune this at the end in terms of the, of, of the properties is a bit more subtle, because then you have to also... Thank you very much. If anybody has 
Any other questions? Uh, well, yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a, a simple question. I mean, uh, what are the necessary tunings uh, that are needed uh, in the present alloys, you know, for uh, the biomedical applications? Uh, like currently, we have a lot of equipments in the biomedical sector for ortho, for example, orthopedic implants and all. Yeah. But what exactly, what kind of tunings we need for uh, hmm. the biomedical? I Again, that's that's a, that's a tough question because it branches in a lot of different directions. Uh, I can only tell you what we do in Austria at the moment, or what we do in Germany and Europe. Let's see. One direction is to say, okay, of course, it would be nice to have something that is really biodegradable. So you probably all know all these efforts about, let's say, magnesium alloys, magnesium calcium, magnesium calcium zinc alloys, and so on. Uh, where I would say this is one way to go, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I think this is one, one interesting direction. The other direction that we pursue, like the colleagues in Japan, uh, is to say, okay, we want to match basically the stiffness, or in other words, in simple words, the Young's modulus much closer to that of bone. Although also keeping in mind that bone can also have be trabecular bone, be different arrangements, a slightly varying, of course, Young's modulus. So in simple words, to go away from something like the 120 uh, GPA of a classical titanium alloy towards something like in beta titanium alloys where you may have 40 or 50 or something like that for, for the Young's modulus. So this is a second direction you can go. The third direction you can go is, of course, uh, that's one of the problems that we have, especially for for kids or implants that should be implanted in in, in into ch in children. Uh, a, you want to have something that is bioresorbable, that you don't have to take it out after three years again, but that it simply dissolves. The other problem is that in a lot of cases you have a lot of inflammatory reactions. So we also think about something like antibacterial coatings, iron release of whatever, copper, silver, uh, things like that to stop local inflammation. So you, you can drive this in a lot of different directions. Then of course you can, besides making plates, screws, whatever, you can also think about porous structures, you can also think about additive manufacturing of some of them. So that's a that's a whole area, I would say, right? And yeah, would yeah. Say that's similar. It's probably similar in India. Uh, I think yes, sir, that's true. But uh, yeah, I got an idea about uh, what I was asking. So yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. So to to give you an idea, just just a little snapshot. I have one PhD student who simply tries to shape metallic glass systems, uh, creating surface patterning plus additional surface functionalization to somehow promote a antibacterial features, let's say, and on the other end, promote cell ingrowth. I have another one who tries to develop new titanium alloys. Uh, the third one who basically tries to look more in detail for their shaping characteristics. There is a fourth one uh, who simply tries to do this for some selected alloys with additive manufacturing. So it goes in a lot of different directions. No? Yeah, yes, sir. I would like to love to connect with them in future regarding this. Uh, <coughs> what I would simply suggest is holds for basically everybody who still has a question at the end or an idea or whatever, just drop me an email and I promise I will reply. I don't promise that I reply immediately. Uh, <laughs> that's my bad habit. Uh, but I will in one or the other way reply. And I'm always happy if I can. Sure, sir, sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Once again, uh, and... Uh, as a vote of thanks, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you that uh, uh, within a short period of time, we have uh, organized uh, 
uh, different lectures and the workshop series. And uh, today is the introductor, in, introductory speech. And that actually open up uh, new directives so that uh, those who are participants, you can actually think uh, beyond whatever is a conventional process or conventional materials, cutting edge uh, technology. So uh, once again, I will thank sir uh, for accepting our inv invitations and uh, providing such a wonderful talk uh, and uh, describing in so details. Uh, and also I will thank all the faculty members of United Aukalna, the participants, those who are joined through Microsoft Teams and uh, through YouTube. And also like to thank all the student members of uh, Sri Lanka United Aukalna Materials Advantage Chapter and Indian Instrumentals Aukalna Student Chapter. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. And th thanks a lot for this opportunity. I enjoyed it a lot. And as I said, it's a pity that that I can't be in India, uh, but I think there will be another chance sometime anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, it's, it's, it's your pleasure, sir. It's your pleasure. When the uh, situation will improve, it's your pleasure to welcome you in uh, Raukela. So that will be, uh, will be a great honor from our side. Thanks so much and have a great time. Stay safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Stay safe, sir. Bye. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Have a nice day. Bye.